man? What mic do they have? Faculty, Urban Studies and Planning. Alexander Moore, I'm an undergrad community development major. David Apple, graduate program chair. And I'm uh, Chris Monsier, faculty member in Civil and Environmental Engineering. Welcome to today's uh, Friday's Transportation Seminar, together with my colleagues uh, Jennifer Dill, Robert Keane, Miguel Filiotti, and John Gleeby. We co organized this uh, seminar. We're very pleased today to have a co our colleague from Oregon State University, Professor Karen Dixon, to talk to us today about urban roadside safety. What can we do? I would ignore it. Okay. Um, so, my name is Karen Dixon at Oregon State. Um, but just so you'll have a little background, I actually came back from the industry, so I was a practitioner for a long time. <laughs> we'll just assume I started really young, and I'll just tell you it was more than 10 years, and just use your imagination. And then I was a professor at Georgia Tech for nine and a half years. And um, then I decided that I was tired of um, some of the rat race in the big city, and I moved to Corvallis. And so now I've been at Corvallis for a couple of years. And um, my background when I was a practitioner was uh, land development. I did highway um, improvement projects. Um, I did um, residential development. And um, ultimately, I ended up doing interchanges in airports, which was where I ended um, when they finally sent me back to get my master's degree and I stayed put in academia. Um, but my real love is, of course, transportation operations and safety. And um, that's really the reason I came back into academia is because I was a little frustrated when I was dealing with um, students that I had just hired, had just graduated, uh, or even some other people who just took policies and interpreted them verbatim and didn't understand the concepts behind them. And so I decided it would be nice if instead of whining about them that I would go back and teach them. So that's kind of a little bit of background about why I'm now here in um, the university setting. The thing I want to talk to you about today is <clears throat> a project on urban roadside safety. This was a project that was done for the National Cooperative Highway Safety Program. Um, it will ultimately be incorporated into Chapter 10 of the Roadside Design Guide. It's an AASHTO document. Uh, if you've ever seen this document, Chapter 10 right now is horrible. It really gives you no useful information about urban roadside safety. It suggests you use a clear zone similar to a clear zone in a rural environment. And though that would be ideal, that's really not very practical because we have a lot of demands for that space. And so I want to talk a little bit about that project and some of the conclusions that we've come up with. So the presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the goals of the project, give you a little background about what we found out while we were starting this project. We had two different tasks that we used, uh, one with, with varying success. One was a case study review, one was a quarter study analysis, and then I'll tell you the recommendations we've come up with. So first, the goals. 
<clears throat> at the beginning of the project, we established essentially three primary goals. And the first one was to find ways that we can address roadside safety um, in the areas where we can't achieve this wide clear zone. <laughs> Recognizing optimally having this wide clear zone is the ideal thing, but realistically it's probably not practical. And so what we could do in those environments. Uh, the second was to identify solutions that uh, common stakeholders have um, in this environment, this urban environment, and try and find ways to address that. So for example, in an urban environment, we certainly need to have sidewalks. How do we adequately place those sidewalks in the roadside environment was one of the things that we looked at. I'm not going to talk much about that today, but um, to make sure that we address all users, not just the motor vehicle users. And then provide guidance on safe application of roadside elements in the urban environment, primarily for people who are designing the road or the roadside environment. <clears throat> so just a little background. Um, the standard approach for any safety, roadside safety project is we hope that they stay on the road and never encounter the roadside condition. So if we can, we try and find ways to keep them on the road and, and have them not leave the road. That would be the perfect world, but we know realistically that people run off the road uh, at high rates, sometimes higher in the rural environment, perhaps not quite as often in the urban environment, but we've noticed an increase in that in the urban environment as well. So when they do run off the road, trying to find ways to minimize um, the chance that they're going to have crashes that are going to be very severe, you know, like they could flip over their car or run into a tree or a pole. If there's some way we can strategically locate devices to keep that from happening, that sure would be our desire. And um, so those are our kind of basic goals. So the background, um, we went and we looked at the literature, of course. That's what all good engineers and researchers do. And um, to see what has been done before and what is known. Unfortunately, we found out a lot is not known. We have a lot of crash information, but that's about it. And then we went and also did some surveys to find out the perception of some of the roadside safety issues. Uh, most of the literature was on rural two-lane roads. That is, of course, the number one crash cause on the rural two-lane roads, so certainly I understand why the most of the literature was in that area. But then they were taking the principles they had learned in that environment and trying to apply it in other environments, which really wasn't particularly practical. Um, and then uh, we found that hardly no one knows anything about urban roads with the exception of there have been tests on raised curb versus sloped curb and deflection angles and whether or not curbs can redirect traffic. There were some tests on that, but that was about all we knew about the roadside environment in the urban uh, region. Historically, in the Roadside Design Guide, which is the AASHTO recommended document, they use this clear zone concept, and it's based on traffic volume. It's based on the slope of the road, you know, if it's traversable. Um, and it can be a width up to or even exceeding 30 feet wide from the edge of the travel lane. Well, in the chapter, current Chapter 10, they suggest that if you can't achieve that, at a minimum, you have to have an operational offset, which is a foot and a half. Now, it's been misinterpreted for many years that that's a safety criteria. It is absolutely not a safety criteria. It's an operational offset, which means you can open a car door, or as you drive by, it won't take off your rearview mirror. A good thing, I think. Um, maybe if there's a tree, you won't knock into the branch. It, that's the purpose of the operational offset. It's not a safety measure, and so what we're trying to do is clarify that in this document, and then make some recommendations, and maybe what would be appropriate lateral offsets from the road that would be safety offsets that perhaps don't quite meet, meet this clear zone. Because you can see, of course, there are a lot of demands for the clear zone space. So we did a survey. One of the things we asked is um, clear zones um, do not and cannot exist in urban areas. And we um, decided to strategically split this into two interview groups. One was state DOTs, and the other were city and county representatives. And to see what kind of disparity there was in their responses to this. And so it was interesting because um, Eighty-five percent of the cities and counties say, yeah, you can't have this wide clear zone. Uh, much smaller percentage, still more than 50 percent, but a much smaller percentage of the DOTs thought it wasn't achievable, though I think that they're starting to come around on this. Um, the other issue is it's very hard to figure out how to get everything into this limited right-of-way, and you have to find some way to balance these needs, which can be particularly frustrating. Um, you can see this one to the left. This is an intersection in Gwinnett County, which is in Georgia. Uh, and the one to the right, I think that's a shot in California. And you can see that one has um, a wide, wider lateral offset, the one on the right, whereas the one on the left uh, has a lot of noise at that intersection. And not to mention, uh, there are driveways within 40 feet from every curb return. And so not only do you have objects that you can run into, you have convenient driveway curb brakes to direct you into them. So that was an uh, issue that needs to be looked at. So we asked in the survey again um, if we thought 
But sometimes the requests from stakeholders, a stakeholder could be anyone from uh, go a governing jurisdiction to someone who wants that driveway or someone who wants to put the utility pole at a location, um, where they thought that the state design guidance was conducive to those type of things. Uh, and city and counties um, said that they don't think so. This, the question was, is it not or incompatible? And the states were like split 50% roughly. Thought, you know, the state guidance is acceptable. And then the other half either didn't agree or uh, didn't agree or disagree. So as I mentioned, we decided to explore this study to try and figure out how we can at least get some tangible evidence on roadside safety. And we split it into two tasks. And one was a case study review. That one had limited success, frankly. The other one was a quarter study, which had robust success. And so I'm going to briefly tell you about the case study review, just so you'll know what it can be used for. And we went and looked for s select projects that were identified as beautification or streetscape projects. So if someone went in and they said, I'm widening my road, I'm putting a two-lane road, I'm going to make it four lanes, and I'm going to do roadside improvements, we didn't look at that project because obviously there's a lot of confounding information. They're widening the road, changing capacity, speeds might be changing. We're not going to get a very good idea about what kind of improvements, roadside improvements, um, you know, what effect they had. The other thing is that we were hoping that we could find projects in, in an ideal world, this would have been great, where there's only one roadside improvement occurring at a time. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. We found one or two projects where they moved utility poles back. That was about the only example we could find of that. But most of them, they were um, putting in buffer strips between the curb and the sidewalk. They were putting in landscaping plans. Um, they were maybe putting in um, bulb outs for curb. They were doing roadside improvements that had marginal effects on the road. Sometimes they were adding a bicycle lane, and that would make a little difference in the width. Usually they were restriping the road, so it didn't have a big effect. So what we ended up doing is having these beautification um, projects that had some roadside improvements, and um, then doing before and after crash analyses, just so that if an agency wants to, um, say, go out and put in this sidewalk, put a buffer strip that's six feet wide, they have ADT of this nature, and if they want to go out there, can they get a sense of whether or not it will hurt or help safety? I think they can be used for that, but for us to have, be able to say exactly what the effects were um, really didn't work out. Um, the cases, we looked at several. We, we still have three that are in partial status. We hopefully are going to wrap those up pretty soon. But we were trying to get international representation, so we went to Arizona, Minnesota, North Carolina, of course, Oregon. Um, and um, there's two Oregons. There's a Bend and a Portland, um, some sites in both, Montana and even Utah. And uh, saw a wide variety of safety results from these as well. The remaining three, one is in the state of Washington, one is also in North Carolina, and the third is actually here in Oregon. This is just an example of the type of data that we collected for a, for a particular case study so that someone can have an idea about um, what kind of improvements they had. We also showed the specific crash information, how many crashes, crash rates, the construction year. So you know, of course, that that's not factored in. You're never going to include the construction year or years. In one case, it was four years of construction. Um, we showed all this information so that you can kind of get a sense of what the road improvements actually were. Um, we did have one or two sites where um, in their beautification project, they reoriented a curve, a horizontal curve. Uh, it was too sharp. They flattened it. We kept those in and we asterisked them to let people know that those two sites, you have to recognize there were moderate road improvements. We tried to not have any project that had more than 12-foot lane width changes, but that one actually was a geometry change. And of course, anybody want to guess what would happen if you flatten the curve on a road? Speeds go up or down? Up, right? Everybody agree? Unless you, know, you have a law enforcement officer standing there waving at you. And then, of course, speeds. They're going to be legal, of course, like we all drive. So this is an example of some of the data. This one had a three-year construction. So it was 2001, 2002, and 2003 was the construction year. If the project started in the middle of the year, we excluded the entire year. We had plenty of crash data on almost every site, and so um, we didn't want to um, challenge the data. So here we took before and after. We did some comparisons to try and find out if we had changes in crash 
statistics. We did it on frequency, we did it on rate, we did it on severe, severe and fatal in the also court because we're looking at roadside crashes. Since the largest percentage of them are single vehicle crashes, we looked to see if it had an effect on single vehicle crashes. The two that we looked at for the most to see if we thought they were, um, we thought were applicable to ours is of course the severe and fatal because you never want to increase fatals if you can help it and then single vehicle crashes. But um, if you had improvements in all four, then that was a pretty good indication that you're not going to really create a problem for safety. If you had decreases in all four categories, that probably indication that you need to look a little closer at the project. So it can tell you some information, but maybe it's not going to tell you everything you need to know. So the, cut, the quarter study analysis was a little different. What we came up with is a harebrained data reduction um, exercise that was very, very time consuming. But in the end, Ended, to be, ended up being very fruitful. And so what we did is we identified urban arterial roads that had a really large number of fixed object crashes or single vehicle crashes. Um, and we tried to make sure, of course, we would have good crash information and location information for these sites. So um, we also want to make sure we had five years worth of crash information. And when we identified these corridors, we tried to have them long enough to where they had crashes in one section of the corridor and no crashes in another section of the corridor. So you could also go along the road and figure out what's different about this section than that section and why are we having crashes in one location, not the other. Uh, so we videotaped them. And some of them, our goal was to have about four states represented and have about 15, 20 miles worth of urban road. But we found one road um, in Orange County, California, that had more runoff the road fatal crashes than any road we could possibly find. And anybody from Orange County, California? Okay, good. <laughs> and they had the speed limit posted at 55 miles per hour, and they had on-street parking. So when I found the site, I automatically knew what was wrong with the site, but still we did the videotape, we did the drive-through, and as you can guess, we had a lot of nighttime crashes when the people weren't parked on the road. Um, we had a lot of pole crashes because they had so many lanes that they put all of the poles up next to the road. The sidewalks were ridiculous. They had them very narrow and they had poles in the middle of the, of the sidewalks where, of course, accessibility was not provided. So you can see it had a lot of issues to it. So that one was like 22 miles long, just that one quarter, but I felt I couldn't exclude it, you know, obviously. So what we ended up having, having was um, in California, we had 47 miles of videotaped footage and we had to drive both directions of travel. So that would really be 94 miles of staring at video footage trying to figure out what's going on with these roads. And we had a similar road in Illinois, um, and it was by one of the Great Lakes. So um, we felt like we had to include the entire corridor, but most of the other corridors were six to eight feet, I mean, six to eight miles long or shorter. So um, I won't bore you with the details about how we reduced all the data, but I will tell you that by looking at the crash statistics and looking at the site characteristics, it was clear that these were the most common objects. This is not a shocking thing to me at all. They're what I would have expected in an urban environment, but these were the things that were hit the most. Utility poles and light standards and traffic signs, traffic signals were number one. They were hit more often than anything else. Trees were number two. Uh, medians and islands came in third. Uh, mailboxes were four, but I will point out that we were looking at arterial roads. so mailboxes were maybe at the extreme ends when it was a transitional zone uh, coming from some sort of a rural to an urban and so mailboxes weren't as predominant along these quarters as, as they could be others. And then we had other things you would expect, fences and ditches, guardrail structures, items like that that we saw were commonly hit. For every site we developed um, a um, spot map. And a spot map is just a quick way for you to figure out where all the crashes are and see if there are any clusters. And if you can see clusters in these spot maps, then that tells you maybe, for some reason, something about the road at that one location is confusing. And maybe people just, you know, wig out at that location. Who knows? But let's go take a look at that spot. Uh, if you see a little star, um, and on this one, there's a little star right here. I don't know if you can make it out because it looks like it's kind of rounding its corners off. But that was a fatality. So we tried to make sure we knew where fatalities occurred. And this particular road that I have shown, you can see that we had clusters and then we had a stretch with no crashes. That was the type of corridor I mentioned that we tried to find so we could determine what had happened and, and not surprisingly they'd had a roadway improvement project and they had uh, made some modifications to the roadside in that area you don't see all those clusters on. This one is in Illinois. It's south of Chicago, kind of southwest of Chicago in Will County. Anybody from Will County, Illinois? Okay, good. I'm batting a thousand so far. 
Um, and here we had several fatalities at this particular site. Uh, you can see there's one that's right here. You see there's one right here. There's one in this whole conglomerate of crashes. They got so clustered together we started stacking them after a while, though the crashes didn't literally stack up. But we couldn't get enough space in there for all the crashes that happened at this one particular location. And interestingly enough, these two fatals over here were just you know, fluke accidents. People ran off the road and into a building. Both of them. They just ran off the road and into a building. What are we going to do about that? Should we quit putting buildings in our urban environment? Probably not. But there might be something we could do. We could perhaps do some sort of plant layering and have some sort of attenuation with plant layering that could slow vehicles down and make the severity less. There are things we could do. Um, in locations like that. And both of these did have an opportunity for doing something like that. The place that you see all the stacked crashes, what really happened here was kind of a strange thing. At one time, the state highway um, started up here, and it came down like this and went on down. And then they decided, since this was kind of going through their central business district, and by the way, we tried to find high-speed arterials, but if it happened to go through a central business district, that was a bonus because then we got a wide variety of arterial conditions, which would be interesting. Well, they changed it, and they made it a one-way pair, essentially. So this is one way going, going to the west and then south, and then they changed this to where it was one way going to the north and to the east. And when they did that, they had bridge, a couple of bridges right in here, and the bridges had one lane in each direction of travel before they made it a one-way pair. So when they made it a one-way pair, um, now they had two lanes in one direction of travel, and so they had the cars split, and they had to go around the um, wall on the bridge. And all those crashes you see right there are people running into the bridge. They're running into the center column of the bridge. So there's not much we can do about that. That was just based on someone's decision to do an unusual thing at that location. But we did find other interesting things at this site. This site had some problems with bulb outs that then had trees placed in the bulb out. Anybody think, anybody think that's a great idea? What would happen for a bulb out with a tree? Everybody know what a bulb out is? The curb bulbs out to make the pedestrian crossing distance shorter. If you put a tree in the bulb out, what do you think happens? Say, let's say when nobody's parking, for example. Well, it can mess up sight distance. Cars can run off and hit the tree. Um, you know, there's a wide variety of issues that can come up with it. You just have to be careful about what type of trees you put there. Put something frangible, which will give if it's impacted. So here are basically our findings and our recommendations to NCHRP and ASHTO based on the summary of data that we have. And... Um, I have the first one I'll call to be expected observations. This is something that you know I could have predicted before I started the project, so I'm not surprised to see it. Uh, one is that roadside ditch and non-traversable headwalls and culverts were often impacted. Uh, everyone in the rural environment knows that this is a common issue. If you don't have traversable lens landscape and if you have some sort of um, culvert that someone can hit at the driveway, you know, it will launch a vehicle. So when we have these in urban environments, we had the same experience. So we saw that. Um, we saw that if you had really untraversable roadside grading, that that caused people to have crashes. Often cars flipped over. Um, we had a few scenic sites. I mentioned that we had one by the Great Lakes in Chicago. We also had one next to Disneyland in California, and we had one next to the Pacific Ocean. And interestingly, it also, oh, and we had one down on Coronado Island. And at each of these, at the main scenic point, we had a cluster of crashes roadside crashes. So people at these really nice scenic locations decided to run off the road and hit things. What do you think that would be? Are they, are they familiar drivers, you think? Probably they've come to try and see the scenic thing and they're looking at the roadside and not at the road. And so our suggestion is when you have a scenic place, it's not a real big surprise to us that something like that would happen. Maybe you should have bigger setbacks at locations like that and expect that you have unfamiliar drivers. So that's why I call that a, a to-be-expected observation. And then we had a couple of places where instead of having barrier curb or vertical curb, they had sloping curb. But yet they then had items right up next to the back of the curb within the one and a half to two foot um, operational offset. And at those locations we had heightened crashes because there was nothing to redirect the vehicle. And even though barrier curb or vertical curb is not really intended to re redirect a vehicle at speeds of 35 miles per hour or less, it has some minimal redirection capabilities. So that you can, if you hit it, you can, if you're going slow enough, be bumped back over. A sloping curb is just going to launch you into that object. And so we saw a misuse of sloping curb. Uh, then we went in and um, we, I wanted to evaluate, frankly, trees. But I had a problem because unless the tree was all scarred up, um, 
I couldn't really tell which tree was involved in a crash. Because in most places where there were crash trees, they had a lot of trees, and some of them were close to the road and some of them were far away from the road. I could see a few that were scarred up, and um, you know those were pretty obvious, and they were almost always next to the road. But something I could always find were poles and light standards and posts. Now, posts are generally breakaway, and so normally I wouldn't include them in this category, except that two of the states, um, the d crash data we had was HSIS data. It's Highway Safety Information Systems data from the Federal Highway Administration. They maintain that. And they have poles and posts slumped into one category definition, so I have to put them into the same category. Uh, most of them were actually poles and not posts, thank goodness, but still I have them in the same category. So we could go in and identify the poles, the light standards, and the posts and figure out um, if crashes occurred at those locations. And those were pretty obvious because often if you have a utility pole sitting four feet from the road at one location, 20 or 30 feet down the road, it's sitting basically at the same lateral offset. So you can pretty well get an idea that you're looking at either the pole or a pole within one or two poles that was involved in the crash and get an idea about what the safety was. One of the first things that um, people start telling me when I start looking at these is, well, it's all people running off on icy weather. You know, they hit snow or ice, they're running off or fog. So I thought it might be useful to plot um, this data, which we went through literally and manually wrote every single crash that had a pole and a post and where the pole was located so that we could kind of take an assessment on this. We have 503 of these crashes. Some of them did not have the vertical curve. Some of them had slope. But nonetheless, we have 503 of these crashes on our um, 100. Uh, 60 miles or so of quarter that we studied. And you can see the largest percentage of them were certainly dry, uh, smaller percentage were wet, very few of them were inclement weather ones. Most of the inclement weather ones were in Chicago. Chicago had a lot of snow and ice crashes. Um, so most of the others, California had no snow or ice crashes at all that we saw on our sites, but they had plenty of dry and wet crashes. Uh, anyone want to guess what Oregon had? Yeah, we had some wet crashes. Dry and wet crashes, a few wet, a little fog. Then we went, and of those 503, um, we looked at those and to figure out the offsets, but then it's not really reasonable to compare roads that don't have vertical curb to the roads that do have vertical curb, simply because um, the curb has some limited redirectional capabilities. And so we went and looked to see which ones of those actually have vertical curb. And of those, 456 of those crashes had vertical curb. And we looked to see where were they positioned and what speed? Uh, this is the speed limit. I would like to have the actual speed cars are driving at. But unfortunately, when you have single vehicle crashes, that's really a piece of information we know. Often, the person hits something and drives away, or they say, well, I was only going this speed and nobody really saw it. Uh, or they're killed, and they certainly can't tell you then. And so the speed limit is only an indicator to tell us something about the road characteristics. So if the speed limit is 45 or 55, I know it's a higher speed or urban arterial. If the speed limit is 25, 30, I know it's probably like a central business district type road, a lower speed arterial. And what we found is that 34.4% um, and 28.3% occurred within the 1 to 2 and the 0 to 1 foot offset. Of course, you know, there should be none in this 0 to 1 because the absolute minimum is a 1 and a half foot offset, but nonetheless, there were some. There were some that I think were actually a negative value. The tree trunks were bulging out into the road. You've probably seen those roads. I thought it might be useful to do a cumulative percentage over here to the right, and you can see that within two feet of the road, 62 of the crashes, 62, 63 percent of the crashes occurred. Within four feet of the road, over 80 percent of the crashes occurred. And then, um, you know, four to six feet was 93 percent, and then it goes up. Now, you might say that's because most of these objects are next to the road. Well, certainly, they're not going to hit them if they're not next to the road, so I agree with you there, but it certainly is also an indication that we had other places where we had larger offsets and there were no crashes. So this is a good indicator to tell us that maybe if our goal is to say keep 80% of these crashes from happening, maybe that offset should be something like four feet instead of one and a half feet. Four feet doesn't seem that unreasonable in an urban environment. We have other things we need to do in that four foot space. We're talking about rigid objects. Um, I'm not advocating not putting any objects in that four foot space. I'm advocating not putting rigid objects that would be a harm, harmful to somebody. Um, to break it down even further, we looked at tangent curves and we looked at, at horizontal curves to see if we had a big difference there. As I mentioned before, on the tangent location specifically, we did have from one to four feet, less than one to four feet, we saw objects hit more often, and we had a higher percentage of trucks hitting those objects than cars. I mean, than cars as represented in the in the ADT das, um, crash database. Um, for horizontal curve locations, we found that 
those were hit even more often up to about six feet away from the road. And we got about six feet away, um, then those went away. One of the more common places we saw that was at medians, which I think is something that hasn't really been thought through too um, strongly. We've known for a long time that the outside of a horizontal curve is a hazardous location. People tend to go straight instead of curving, and so they'll run off the road and hit an object. We've known that for a long time. The thing we forget is that if you put a median in the middle of the road and you curve that road to the right, people tend to, to go a little straight there too and they can hit the median as well. So a lot of these crashes were in the median. So our recommendation is this. Um, try and have four feet offset as a general rule of thumb in tangent locations. In circular curve locations, if you can read this hopefully, try and have six feet. So just taper it here at the beginning of the curve, the end of the curve from four feet to six feet. Try and maintain that kind of an offset in an urban environment. And then on the inside of the curve, you want to make sure that you, you maintain the driver's line of sight. Now I've drawn a particularly sharp horizontal curve here. There are some horizontal curves that don't, don't obstruct the driver's line of sight at all. But in this particular case, I've tried to show one that um, certainly would, so you'll know that we need to keep that space available. And then beyond that, you could just maintain your four foot. And um, that will at least help a uh, large percentage of these crashes at horizontal curve locations without horribly compromising the placement of objects in the area. It will have some adverse effect. We're calling these control zones, by the way, zones that you control of object for rigid object placement. Um, and the hope is that there will be like three or four or five control zones ultimately that will be established to improve urban roadside safety. Um, and then um, we'll someday be able to check them after they've been placed. Here's another place we saw a lot of crashes. Lane merges, acceleration lanes, uh, lane tapers. And you can see here on the left, you can see there's a little arrow telling you that this is a lane merge, and here's a pole smack dab at the taper point or within about 10 feet of it. This is a bus bay on the right, and same thing, you have a pole right here. Both of these were hit, both of these were involved in a serious crash, the poles I'm showing you, and we saw that at several locations. Um, and at some locations, we saw the same pole was hit over and over and over again at these tapers. For example, this is State Highway 1, which is the highway that runs along the Pacific Coast in, in the Orange County area. And if you look real close, you'll see there are several places with clustered crashes. And if, I, I mentioned we specifically looked at these clustered crash locations to see if we could determine what the cause was. We looked at the crash database. We went and looked at the physical site characteristics. Um, you'll notice there by Highway 55, just here to the west of it, you'll see there's a large percentage of crashes. All of those crashes were hit, hitting two poles at taper points. All of them. It was just an acceleration lane coming off of Highway 55 and a taper point. There's another taper point, by the way, over here. This was a lane drop about, just past Balboa Boulevard, and same thing. Those are cars hitting a pole at the taper point. So um, we're suggesting that at these taper points, it would be a pretty good idea not to put objects in this location. It seems kind of like a logical um, idea. We saw that, for the most part, if an object was within six feet of the road, it was going to be hit eventually because people are merging into traffic and they've got a lot of things going on. They're looking around. They're trying to figure out if it's safe to enter the road. If they miss the taper and they go straight, they'll hit the object. So we also saw a lot of vehicles hit objects that were offset greater than six feet but within about 12 feet, which is basically the width of that lane if they had gone straight. Um, we also noticed that longitudinally, if an object was placed about 20 feet before or 20 feet after the taper point, it was hit more often than if it was placed um, in the acceleration lane itself or beyond the taper. So we're recommending a buffer zone. This is kind of the general recommendation we have for this buffer zone. Again, you'll see the common theme of four foot. This, of course, would be on either side of the road that you have an acceleration lane. So if you had an acceleration lane on the left side of the road, um, you know, with a median or something, you would certainly do the same thing. At the taper point, you would have a 40-foot object-free zone, 20 feet either side. If you couldn't achieve that, we, we saw that most of these occurred on the, on the near side of the taper point, so we would certainly encourage at least 20 feet on the near side. Um, and then offset is about 12 feet, so that basically if this car here kept on going straight, there would not be an object in its path. So we've just offset the curb line 12 feet, brought our four foot that we had on the straight and intersected it, and that would help you determine your object-free zone for that particular location. Another thing we saw were crashes at intersections. Um, and of course, the first thing you think is, well, it's probably a car trying to avoid another car. And we did actually have information about if it was a car interaction. We knew how many vehicles were involved in the crash. Uh, occasionally, you won't have, if, if there's not a description and one car drove off and they didn't actually impact, you won't have that information. 
Um, but for the most part, we were able to determine whether or not there was a car involved, and certainly that happened a lot. It was like someone would turn in and they, we would swerve to try and avoid the car turning in. But the places where we saw the crashes happen the most were a little alarming. One was at small channelized islands. This could be the nose of a median or it could be a right turn island um, where they then dropped a rigid object, like a signal pole on that island. Um, another was, um, and by the way, I am a huge advocate for pedestrian access, but the placement of the pedestrian access ramps in many cases directed the pedestrian straight towards a signal pole. That's not a conducive alignment for a pedestrian. And it's not conducive for a car either, because if the car actually runs off the road and they hit the pedestrian ramp, they're directed straight towards the, the signal pole. And we saw that a lot. Cars hitting signal poles that were lined up with pedestrian ramps. So there's ways to fix that, move the signal pole in a different location so it's not aligned with, this, with the curb cut, the pedestrian cut. Put pedestrian um, pedal stools with the ped buttons right next to the ramp, which is, by the way, what the accessibility board is encouraging anyway. Uh, and that would take care of that issue. We also found that a lot of cars just aren't very good about making the turn. Uh, often these are trucks, but we saw a lot of cars just couldn't successfully make the turn, and so they would drive up over the curb. So it's logical to move the objects further away from the curb. Um, I don't have a cute little sketch for this, but we basically suggested that you put objects about six feet away from the curb for the curb return issue. You relocate the signal pole so it's not aligned with the pedestrian ramp, and you make sure your channel, channelized islands conform with Ashto's channelized, island, channelized islands, and they give you some minimum recommendations on size for those. The final, and this is the number one crash that we saw, and we saw this over and over and over again. At first we thought it might just be a coincidence. It was so predominant. And it is, oh no, I'm sorry, this is not it. It'll be the next one, I'm sorry. This one is the right turn lane. If you have a high speed right turn lane that's developing, often objects are set off from say the center line of the road or, or the projected lane of the road. And when they have a high speed turning lane developed, they don't move those objects any, way, any further away. And so what happened is, like, you might have objects that were 14 feet away from the road, and then you have a high-speed right turn lane, and now all of a sudden, the objects are only two feet from the road, and we saw those objects were being hit a lot. What we suggested on this is that they have a consistent placement away from the curb, but also that maybe someone take a look at treatments in auxiliary lanes in general, because uh, high-speed right turns are not the only type of auxiliary lane out there. A bicycle lane is an auxiliary lane. There are other types. Um, here's the landscape buffer. I still don't have, I'm still not to the highest crash one. A landscape buffer, if you had a landscape buffer that was three feet wide or less and you had rigid, rigid objects in it, it was hit almost always. I mean, it was a very dangerous configuration. Uh, and a lot of places have landscape buffers or buffer strips that are only three feet wide. They don't necessarily have to be landscape, but buffer strips are three feet wide between the back of curb and the edge of sidewalk. If you had buffer strips that were six feet wide or greater, we saw, and you had smaller trees, say, in the middle, for example, um, we saw less problems with those. Um, unless it was like this. You can see here, this is actually a turn bay, and they put the trees directly in line with the turn bay. At this location, those trees kept on getting hit because at night when no one was parked there, or excuse me, parking bay, at night when no one was parked there, then um, people were following the curb line and they would hit the trees. So there are some cases where you want to be careful about how you do it. Um, we also saw some places where um, they were very clever about their placement of the pole. They either put it on the far side of the sidewalk or they put it really close to the sidewalk and then they had other more frangible landscaping elements in the center of the, of the buffer strip. And those poles rarely got hit. Whereas at this site, you can see how they have the poles pretty much lined up with the trees. What do you want to guess happened at this site? The poles almost always got hit. The trees rarely got hit at that location. These are very small trees. They're not going to cause a fatality, but the pole will cause a fatality. So if you could have the trees um, be further in front and the poles further away, that would be helpful. This one over here, they used a concept called landscape um, or, or plant layering, where they have frangible plants in front of the trees. We had absolutely no, no crashes whatsoever into this wall because they had been clever about having some sort of energy absorption device in front of rigid objects. So our recommendation was try and, if you have a landscape buffer that's three feet wide or less, uh, only put breakaway frangible objects in it, um, and place poles, light standards, and others further away from the curb line as far away as you can. If you can put them on the far side of the sidewalk, that's great. I recognize moving a light stander on the far side of the sidewalk has other implications that could be safety related. You could affect the illumination of the road. So you have to be careful about what you're recommending and, and moving it too far away, I think that probably that would be a good research topic to be looked at is the placement of it and how that would affect 
illumination for the road. Now it's going to improve illumination for the sidewalk probably, but not for the road. Or put it closer to the sidewalk at a minimum. Uh, this is the number one crash location, driveway locations. And can anybody guess, if you, let's take a look at this picture to the left. Can anybody guess what's wrong with that picture? Does that look like a pretty decent driveway? Yeah? They sure do. You know, one of the things that are very, very common uh, uh, recommendations for curb is that it provides positive guidance in an urban environment. In a rural environment, we'll have like a white strip painted on the right edge of the road. And so if, let's say for example, heaven forbid that you're um, impaired in some way or perhaps fatigued, uh, often in these defensive driving courses, they tell you just to watch the white line, keep your eyes down, watch the white line and follow that. Well, in the urban environment, it's the curb if there's not a white line marked. When someone is following the curb and you have a curb cut, a driveway, they lose their positive guidance. And we saw over and over and over again, this was a commercial driveway here, so it was almost like an intersection. Here we have it as just a typical normal driveway. Over and over and over again, we saw poles placed on the far side of the driveway were hit. I'm talking fatalities. These were serious crashes being hitting these poles. Now, there's a reason why they're put on the far side of the driveway. And when I say far side of the driveway, as you're driving along the side beyond the driveway instead of closer to you, which I would call the near side of the driveway. Why wouldn't I put the pole on the near side of the driveway? The you're out. Exactly, because it messes up sight distance. The car's pulling out, they want to look to the left, and it'll be in their way. If they look to the right, it could be in their way, but probably won't block an entire vehicle like it would, would um, for the left. Um, so, our recommendation on this is that objects should be placed on the near side of the driveway, but not in the sight visibility triangle, or on the far side, as long as you keep it outside of this commonly hit zone. This is kind of a sketch of the area that we saw it happening most often. If you were within 10 to 15 feet of the driveway, pretty much for the entire width of the right-of-way, I would say not to put anything, 10 to 15 feet of the driveway, um, that object got hit, and usually hit frequently. And then, of course, you want to make sure you keep these lines of sight available. Other than that, you would try and maintain these four-foot offsets. Now, um, so I want to make sure I have the line of sight, and I want to keep this space available. Can anybody think about a common thing often put next to driveways that, that might mess up? Mailbox. Mailboxes. What are we going to do about mailboxes? If you move them farther away from the driveway, who is that going to inconvenience? Perhaps. It depends on how frequent the driveways are placed. We can have cluster mailboxes, and they do have the U.S. Postal Service has some approved cluster mailboxes that have about four mailbox units in them. We could possibly use those. Those are not popular with residents. If you move them farther away from the driveway, if you want to walk down, let's say the resident is at home. It's, let's say it's a residential place, just you know, for conversation purposes, because that's where most of the mailboxes are. You walk down to the end of the driveway in the morning in your fluffy slippers and your bathrobe after eating your bonbons. Oh, that's just me. So you do that. You get down to the end of the driveway and you think, okay, so now I want to get my mail and my newspaper. And then you have to walk down the curb a ways. You know, it's just not a convenient thing for the, for the person living at the house. So, of course, this is a controversial recommendation for mailbox placement. There are some ways that it could be addressed. Of course, as long as you use a mailbox that is breakaway, that wouldn't be an issue. You know, if someone hits the mailbox, yeah, it's going to cost. You have to play, replace the mailbox, but no one's going to die. That's our concern. We don't want serious or fatal injuries at these locations. So, of course, you might guess I'm not a fan of those ornamental brick mailboxes uh, that are often placed on the far side of driveways. That just makes it even more hazardous. Um, I recognize I used to live in Atlanta, and when I was in Atlanta, every Saturday and Friday night, it was a sporting event. The kids came down the street with their baseball bats and they would try and hit as many mailboxes. Is that just a Georgia thing or do they do that? All right. So, of course, I know that there's a reason that they have these rigid mailboxes, so you have to be creative. We put one of those plastic Tupperware mailboxes up and occasionally they could pop it off of the mount, but we could just put it right back on the mount. So there are clever things you can do and still have a safe roadside mailbox placement. So in conclusion, um, I just generally wanted to say that the urban roadside can be enhanced um, when we know that there are high crash locations. So we saw the Illinois one where there were elevated crashes at one particular location and it happened to be where they had split and done the one-way pair and that they had two lanes going in the same direction around a bridge pier. 
Well, that seems to me then that you should go out and treat that one condition, maybe with energy absorption devices of some sort, impact attenuation device. There was not an impact attenuation device at the front of that, of that pier column, by the way. Um, so you can look at high crash locations, but we know that we have, statistically speaking, several high crash locations that need to be treated. And we should probably take a look at those specifically. And those are, of course, the driveways, the intersections, the outside of curbs, and then the lateral placement, as well as a few of the others that we've mentioned. Um, and of course, any engineer is going to have to, or researcher is going to have to make recommendations for future research. And of course, I mentioned one that now I see I didn't put on there, which is um, testing the illumination for moving the light standard, which certainly needs to be addressed as well. But I think that there's, it's a whole lot cheaper to put down paint than to redo all of these driveways. I think that there is a reason for someone to come in and study whether or not this is a positive guidance issue at these driveways. And if we had the white edge stripe at these locations, if that would reduce these crashes, I think that would be a very important thing to test out because I think that would be by far a quick remedy for some of these crashes if we could do that. So that would be one thing I thought would be interesting to study. Also, um, we have a lot of landscaping and I myself seek roads with landscaping. I don't design roads with landscaping because then, of course, I am held um, in the opportunity of being subject to litigation, but I often drive on roads with landscaping and look for them. And um, so I think what we need to do is start finding ways to safely incorporate landscaping elements into this roadside environment because they are being incorporated, incorporated and they're just being incorporated in a less than safe manner because we don't have good techniques. And so if we come up with ways to have frangible uh, landscaping treatments, we could put them maybe in that three-foot buffer strip without having adverse consequences. I think that that would be an interesting thing for us to work on. And then this issue about the auxiliary lanes. There's the high-speed um, right turn lane. There's a turn bay. There's a bicycle lane. There's a bus bay, a bus lane. When should we have the clear zone and or the operational offset or the lateral offset that we're now recommending be located from the curb face versus from the through lane? And I think that those are interesting things. I think it should be speed related, maybe have something to do with um, the demand of people driving straight on those roads, conflicts, but they certainly need to be addressed. So that kind of summarizes the research that we're wrapping up right now. Questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, your, your talk was ex pretty much exclusively focused on preventing cars from leaving the road or what to do if they do leave the road. Um, but, uh, of course, another crucial component of safety on the roads is speed. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I was just wondering just uh, to what extent you consider that, that sort of input in, ter in terms of safety. For instance, on your horizontal curve demonstration, you talked about, like, for instance, keeping sight distances clear, which is, you know, a safety issue, but it also can have the effect of giving drivers the confidence to sort of drive faster. Whereas uh, with the landscape buffer, you, you um, you recommended, say, moving frangible objects like landscaping a little closer to the road to prevent uh, drivers from impacting these light standards and utility poles and so on. And that would also, I mean, in, from, from what I've learned, it seems that that would have the effect of also reducing speeds, which would sort of be a complementary effect for improving safety. Yes. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. So we actually did discuss um, speed reduction strategies quite a bit in this study. I didn't really focus on that in this presentation because that wasn't really what they hired us to do, and so I've kind of told you what they... We recommended a few things. There's perceptual landscaping treatments, and perceptual landscaping treatments are from New Zealand. It's a very interesting concept where um, they'll actually delineate the road again with um, either plant layering or something that's a breakaway type device. And it gives you the impression, first of all, it'll tell you if there's a curve ahead. And so you know there's a curve ahead and it actually makes people slow down even if it ends up being a gentler curve. So that's one thing that we saw, but that's on the outside of the curve. You could still do it the six foot offset on the outside of the curve and it would still do that because it's a perceptual thing as you're approaching the road. The other is they recommended tapering the landscaping towards the road and it gives the impression that the road is narrowing. Um, that was one of the things that we saw that actually uh, has had some pretty positive effects on a speed reduction. Um, and then there's no question that things like tree canopies affect speed. We know that for a fact. Um, there's been a lot of anecdotal studies about it. We've actually done some, I've personally done a couple of studies on a canopy treatment. We haven't uh, found some statistically significant findings yet. We're still working on that. So we had a lot of things we saw that affected speed. Um, what we were trying to do, though, is find ways on this particular project to address the needs of our client, which is people are speeding no matter what. Now what do we do? So 
we were trying to find something that would help with those conditions. But I certainly agree that there are good treatments that will help reduce speed, and that's a great approach. With the exception of I'm not an advocate for putting the, the rigid tree in the bulb out. <laughs> yes. We did look at whether or not drivers were under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And um, I will first give a caveat, which is my normal caveat when someone asks me this question on any safety research. Every state has a process where they record toxicology results, and that is it takes about six months to get toxicology results back and incorporate it in a database. And every state usually has to wrap up their state crash database somewhere around March or April of the following year. So if you look at a crash database, unless someone died at the site or someone was given a breathalyzer right at the site, um, often we do not have the toxicology results back for October, November, and December. So miraculously, when you look at a crash database, it looks like people don't drink during the holiday season, um, which, of course, we know is not the case. And so when I look at toxicology, I often look at the month because I'm just automatically discounting the fact that I'm going to have accurate information at the end of the year. Um, what we found is that a lot of the crashes were in the daytime and not the nighttime, but most of the crashes that were at nighttime were high speed, no seat belt, and perception of impairment. Yes, unfortunately. Yes? It seems like a lot of these options could be prevented with simply a behavioral approach. A lot of them are just the driver not for failing to make the turn or leaving the roadway for reasons that could be prevented in more of a behavioral type way. I know you didn't look at that, but do you think that continuing education or any other strategies would actually help outside of physically moving rigid objects? Um, so I think that the person who is just a careless driver and involved in the incident, are, those are the less severe crashes in general. Um, and so I think that you could certainly if you can have some sort of wake-up call to get them to behave, you could certainly have a reduction in crashes, but I don't think it would have an effect on the crashes I'm most concerned about, which are the severe and fatals. Most of the severe and fatals are um, at-risk drivers that pretty much are going to zip through the traffic and not pay attention to what's going on. People who fall asleep are a pretty common issue. Um, that's ex it's an extremely high one, actually, is people who fall asleep in an urban environment. I guess they're working weird hours. And um, usually, a uh, knee-jerk reaction, unfortunately, is your foot pushes down on the accelerator, so you actually accelerate when that happens. So I don't think that um, that's the answer completely, but I think that that would always, any educational campaigns that are effective will help. There are mixed results, by the way, on the effectiveness of edu educational campaigns. Some they say do help, and some they say don't, and I haven't really gotten into all of that. Yes? Um, no, nope, the guy behind you is actually... <laughs> recommendations with, with pedestrian safety in particular um, and the classes that I've taken and the information I've heard usually trees uh, trees or bollards or parked cars in a in between the, the moving traffic and pedestrians the, the, often that's in a, in a plant district is a positive thing when I was looking at some of your slides um, and you were talking about removing some of the, the obstacles uh, between the roadway and pedestrians. You saw that the positive thing, but for pedestrians, you know, I'm walking there, I see a tree or a post or whatever it is, that's a really positive thing to prevent a speeding car from coming mm -hmm. hitting me. So yeah. how, how do you how do you balance that? I mean it seems like in some ways a rigid object is very good. So I will be for, first I'll tell you pedestrian research is actually one of my areas and so um, I would never advocate anything that is not going to improve pedestrian safety. However, statistically, every pedestrian study that I've looked at that had objects um, between the, the pedestrian and the curb line, they were ineffective. Most of the pedestrian crashes occur in the road or at the driveways. And so if someone happens to run off the road at one of those locations that's not uh, at an intersection, a mid-block crossing, or at a driveway, um, then usually those things really don't make a difference. Now, having said that, I'm not advocating not putting trees in that area. I'm advocating putting frangible trees, which means that, that if you hit them, they'll break away instead of the person in the car dying. I'm also suggesting that we should have wider strip, buffer strips. And that, of course, is going to be a safety um, issue for pedestrian as well. So I think that there are ways to balance it to still accommodate the pedestrian safety issues. And I think that most of the things we're suggesting are going to enhance pedestrian safety. 
uh, rather than deteriorate pedestrian safety. Yes? I've been working on a corner where we have a problem with um, tree means, means in the tree. And I'm wondering if you've seen a correlation of people outrunning their headlights and they can't see the trees uh, in the horizontal curves. And has it been effective using uh, object markers in the medium to keep them on so you're talking about reflective markers on the trees, for example? Um, oddly enough, reflective markers are attractors. And so if someone's having a visibility problem, they actually drive towards the reflector. So I found that it's not effective, particularly in medians, to, to mark any sort of landscaping feature with a reflector. Same thing with on the edge of the road. It might be better on the edge of the road, but... Um, uh, a common place that you'll see reflectors placed is like on the far side of an intersection. If they have something that gets hit over and over and over, like a controller cabinet, they'll pop up the reflectors. And then you'll see it gets hit even more often. So it's just some sort of a strange um, psychology. I'm not quite sure what it is. But when the driver is impaired, fatigued, or distracted, they go towards the bright light. Um, having said that, there are things like, you know, for example, if you drive through a work zone and you have the, the barrels, they clearly illuminate the work zone. and they're not attractors because they're in a series. So isolated reflectors, I don't really encourage. If you have them in a series, so it's used for delineation purposes, it might be more effective. Unfortunately, most places haven't tried that. Most of them have tried the isolated reflectors, and then they serve as an attractor towards crashes. So it would be interesting to see. Possibly a more effective method would be just long line stripes with reflectorized raised markers or what? Well, you could certainly use um, some sort of reflector, post reflectors that aren't on the tree. So that can help delineate if they overshoot them, they hit the reflector and not the tree. So there are some ways that you could delineate the path without actually putting the object on the rigid object, the reflector on the rigid object. That would probably work. Every once in a while, get knocked down, you just go out and put it back up. Yes? By pavement design, do you mean pavement type? Um, we didn't actually evaluate pavement type, but one thing that we did do is look at conditions of pavement for the sites that we evaluated to see if it was new pavement, if it was um, cracked or spalling, um, you know, poor, poorly maintained pavement. We did look at that. Um, occasionally, someone can say, for example, hit a disruption on the pavement, it'll send them off the road. That was our Chicago sites. And we did see that, um, but we didn't look at it as a unique variable. But we, if we saw it at a site, we certainly cataloged it. But it wasn't a focus point. Yes? What was the recommendation that you give uh, anti-traffic calming devices, which uh, will just encourage drivers to drive faster? So was the speed limit a constant in your case studies? I mean, you didn't want to reduce speed at all? No, um, we had a little table here that shows speed limit would vary from 25 to 55 miles per hour. Um, we're not at all recommending not having traffic calming measures. We're recommending having a safer roadside environment that can also include traffic calming features. So just because you're setting objects six feet or four feet away from the road, I really don't think that that's going to adversely affect speed dramatically. Now, if you take those objects and you set them 16 feet from the road, Different story completely. Um, and then if you still keep objects next to the road, you just have forgiving objects next to the road, then I don't think people are really going to notice much difference. So I don't think it's, I, I personally don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, but I do think that obviously if someone got out there and started making extreme changes, they have to recognize they could have an increase in speed. If they say, well, if four feet is good, 14 feet is better, they need to recognize there might be some adverse consequences to that. Yes? from all these uh, kind of high crash um, locations. Do you think there's a applicability to identifying kind of um, high incidents of bicycle and um, automobile crashes? We actually looked at bicycle crashes. More, we looked at two different bicycle crashes. Uh, well, actually, we had three, but one I didn't expect. We looked at motor vehicle bicycle crashes. We looked at bicycle pedestrian crashes, which are much higher than you would expect. Those are only usually reported if someone's injured enough to go to the hospital. 
And then we also saw bicycle, bicycle crashes, which was for some reason the one that didn't occur to me, though I've had one, so I guess I should have known that that would happen. <laughs> The, there were some um, positive effects on the bicycle lanes that um, actually reduced bicycle crashes. And one is that um, because you have, let's say, a four-foot lane plus a, a gutter pan, that's a further offset of objects from the motor vehicle lane. And we saw fewer roadside crashes at places with bicycle lanes. Um, did we see more bicycle crashes at those locations? Not really. We saw you know, about the same amount of bicycle crashes in every location that we studied. Now, that might be because we have more bicycles here, but they have a bicycle lane. In some other places, they don't have a bicycle lane, so therefore they don't have as many bicycles, and so the numbers might have come out the same. That's hard to say. But we did look and see if there were any bicycle crashes. It's actually in one of our summary statistics, and it never, it never popped up. There were no um, injuries that were fatals for bicyclists, but we did have some pedestrian fatalities in our study, unfortunately. Yes? six feet away from the curve. So do you think the number should be different when there are different curvature? I do think that you might consider uh, geometry. Um, and since we were doing a corridor analysis, and so we have case studies that had a wide variety of geometry, um, we could only use kind of a general offset um, comparison. But if you had an extremely sharp curve, there might be some argument to have it 10 feet away from the curve. Whereas if it's an extremely gentle curve, you might have some argument to keep it at the four feet. So I do think you could consider having some fluctuation in that. So six feet is kind of an average recommendation. That's a good question. Yes? Um, we did look at where pole crashes occurred, and then um, one of the other things we have as a result of our research is a toolkit that um, we provided to AASHTO. They might put it in the appendix, they might put it in the report in the chapter, they still haven't quite decided. In this toolkit, we gave recommendations for minimizing severity at locations where you have to have rigid objects. So other things we talked about is there is the, the slip plate base for the utility pole. We talked about that. Uh, sometimes the car actually drives up the guy wire on a utility pole and then vertically mounts the pole. Um, so we talked about placement of the guy wire might be um, perpendicular to the road instead of longitudinal to the road, which is not convenient if you have a sidewalk next to it. You have to have extra space if you have a guy wire. That the pole should be on the inside of the curve. But you might combine poles. So if you have one pole that's a light standard, one pole that's a utility pole, you might combine the utilities on a single pole was a recommendation. Um, so all these are pretty common recommendations, but we didn't have a chance to study them specifically in this research. Now, having told you that, I actually have done that on a previous project, and I actually was hired by an electric company to study their poles where people were killed. And um, it's a big concern. And you can see, since that popped up as the number one hit object, it's still a big concern in the urban environment. So it definitely warrants some additional research. OK, any other questions? Yes? I don't recall if I looked at that specifically. I did actually um, put in the database whether or not they had, whether it was daytime, dark with lighting, and dark with no lighting. I don't think I looked to see if there was a correlation between them, to be honest. That's an interesting question. I might take a look at that, though. Yes? Just sometimes. <laughs> so, did you include in your study anything that's related to vehicle technology that warns the driver when he deviates from the road or when there's an object ahead, and whether that really uh, contributed to safety and um, reducing crashes? We didn't um, look at any any sort of in influence of in vehicle technology, and the only in vehicle technology that I know has been looked at that might affect runoff the road is um, the, the lane departure system. And what they've discovered is if you have a fatigued driver who receives a lane departure warning, it actually freaks them out and they actually um, speed up. <laughs> but we didn't look at that at all as part of this study, so I really don't think I can comment on it. Yes? Um, I had a question. Is there someone 
um, currently in the process of implementing new um, landscaping development requirements near the offsets? Um, so the quick answer is I'm working with someone at Washington, University of Washington, for that, for that very topic. She's actually in their horticulture and uh, urban forestry department. And um, we're going to give a presentation at TRB if anybody's interested about that topic. Um, and we've talked to a couple of landscaping firms about ways to have um, more creative, frangible uh, planters. So if you have a tree that's not frangible, a tree that's rigid but you went close to the road, is there a way we can create a base that would then give some of the extra breakaway? And we're, we're working on that right now, but it's not ready for prime time yet. Um, do you foresee that becoming a more widely used or recognized solution to a lot of these roadside crashes or the high frequency of crashes that are near the offsets that are only you know minimally spaced from the roads? Not really. I think it's going to be expensive. Um, you know, from everything we looked at, it's kind of like an energy absorption device. When you hit it, it's destroyed. You have to go out and replace several panels of it. I think it's going to be something like that, but I do think that it'll have uh, applications in places that are hazardous or places where you have a lot of pedestrian traffic and you want to keep that extra space between them or something that needs that extra scenic value and so someone wants to pay the extra money. Uh, if we can come up with something that we think will be effective, I think that there will be a demand for it, but I don't see a wide implementation, wide scale implementation, but that would be great if it did. <laughs> yes? You mentioned uh, curbing, barrier curbing, and um, I'm wondering if you came out with any recommendations on, on the height of that curb, an optimum height of a curb that would have the best so as a result of our research, we didn't, but um, as a result of the literature review and looking at some of the recent crash, crash tests, the normal curb height of six inches is the general recommended curb height. Uh, it has plenty of redirectional capabilities for the 35 mile per hour below, as long as your angle is 10 to 15 degrees and not, not sharper. Um, the seven inch curb is sometimes used for some of the unique guardrail treatments so that you can have a guardrail up against the curb without having any launching capabilities. So there are some unique applications for the seven inch curb. Uh, at University of Nebraska, they have a crash center, crash testing center, and they're about to release those results. So they haven't hit the street yet, um, but they'll be out pretty soon about the compatibility of an urban curb with a new type of guardrail, which I think they call the Midwest guardrail treatment, and how the height would correspond. So, but for the most part, uh, in all the literature we saw, six inches seemed to be the recommended curb just to get that redirectional capability. Um, by the way, it's not because six inches is needed. It's usually something a little bit shorter, like five inches, but often we have um, overlays that aren't flared out, and so you have to make the assumption that it's gonna, there's going to be some encroachment on the height eventually. It shouldn't happen, but it does. Any more questions? Professor Taylor from uh, UCLA, uh, Transit's Dirty Little Secret, Analyzing Patterns of Transit Use. And also two reminders, the Oregon ITE Traffic Bowl is Thursday night, free for students, and the, the Trans Now Student Conference is here at Portland State all day Friday. So um, talk to me if you want more information about that. And with that, let's thank uh, Professor Dixon for an interesting presentation today.